This is unfortunate. The sharks have started a circling Isuzu Ute Australia in their palatial tin shed by the Brisbane River. The recipients of Costello's Right Wing Thought Bubble Car of the Year 2022. Goodness me. D-Max's very reputation I all for truck-like endurance and otherwise Herculean prowess out on the road to Dingo Piss Creek could soon be little more than ashes. Far Colonel, as they say on the site where James Cook first dropped the Endeavour's guts in Australia. I'm John Cadogan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap. <laughs> Even Isuzu's, dude. Should you wish to inflict that upon yourself? Free country. Website. Card. As per use UL. Charles Bannister, or Chill B, as he would doubtless have been known in the rap industry, had his career just taken a slightly different path. The cheese of Bannister law, perennial thorn in the side of the car industry, he's behind all of this, okay? T Dub has a dartboard with Chill B's face on it, most probably next to the one containing mine. Anywho, Chill B brought you the timeless class action hip-hop classics, Smoke That Booty, the ballad of Volkswagen Dieselgate, The Humpty Dance, in honour of the Ford Power Shit transmission, and Pack That Pipe, <laughs> a tribute to Toyota's infamous aggregate damages shitbox 2.8 diesel engine. They've launched a class action investigation into the previous generation Isuzu D-Max and MUX for alleged engine bay structural failures and also DPFs that go poopy in trowel. That's always most difficult to explain in the cold hard light of the following morning, is it not? Down at the dry cleaners, at least. <sighs> That's what I heard. This video is sponsored by Olight. There's a winter sale on right now, but it ends at midnight tonight, which is Thursday the 21st. Link in the description. Discounts up to 35%, but time is ticking and do not dilly-dally, dude. The Mighty Warrior 3S, I love this torch. It's a proper retina scorcher for starters, so it is tactically viable if you are attacked by zombies. And it's also just a fairly cool multi-purpose torch for home and the car. But at its brightest, 1850 lumens, plus it is water and drop proof and it will run for 55 hours on the lowest setting. Next up, we've got the O-Bulb Pro if you need just a few lights for when the grid goes down at home, then, dude, here's the winner. Just give one to each kid, and the whinging, I estimate, will be down 30 to 50% multiple modes. They can have a bit of a play with it, throw it at each other, things of this nature. It runs for up to 84 hours on a single charge. It's even got like a distress beacon strobe in red. And they charge in three hours off USB, okay? And you can even control them by an app on your phone and they're under 55 bucks each during the sale. And they might look like toys, but they're properly tough too. They're IPX7 waterproof and 1.5 meter impact resistant. Next up, the Baton 3, I like this one too. It's waterproof and it pumps out up to 1200 lumens on its brightest setting. So it punches well above its weight and it gives you an instant head torch, right? As demonstrated, if you are, you know, sophisticated enough to wet people's imagination by wearing a cap with a dirty big C above the brim. Like, dude, what does that really stand for? Anyway, if you want to work on the car or something and you need both hands free out there in the rain and the sleet and the snow, whatever, it's pretty good for that. And finally, I've got uh, somewhere here, I've got the Olight Freeze 2 Folder. Very slick, very slick indeed. 
juggling a whole bunch of things here, obviously, but I guarantee if you get abducted one day and stuffed into one of those dirty, big, bloody Amazon <laughs> shipping envelopes, you can slash your way to freedom in seconds with the Freeze 2's 154 Chrome Molly Blade. It's really smooth on the deployment front for this knife, right? One-handed, if that's legal, where you roll. And the drop point, right, super practical for use out there in the field. Nice jimping, too, for your thumb. Very well done, Freeze 2 designers. The Freeze 2 is under 90 bucks during the sale, and it's a great kind of knife for a go-bag or a survival kit in a car, right? These kinds of rigs, the survival kit kind of thing, the gear in them has to be good enough to get the job done reliably, but without breaking the bank. So a 400 buck Benchmade Crooked River is probably going to be overkill, whereas something like this, not so much. Link in the description, okay? If you missed the sale, there's a code for 12% off. And as usual, big thanks to Olight for sponsoring this package. Back to Isuzu now. Chill Bees investigators are zeroing in on 90,000 previous generation D-Maxes and MUXs sold between 2017 and 2019. Not really that old, is it? And most of those must still be under warranty now that I think about it. Apparently these fine vehicles have this alleged pesky habit of cracking in the structural bits of the engine bay, which doesn't sound all that good, frankly. Like, last time I looked, best practice for fabrication design generally was to avoid structural cracks in all the bits that hold the engine into the car. We covered that kind of thing one day at university, if memory serves, although it was a long time ago. So all up, not good if proved. Apparently, this process is accelerated if you're the kind of uh, mouth breather who bolts on a bull bar and drives down a corrugated road. I'm looking at you, blue singlet bogan. Like, nobody at Isuzu could have possibly foreseen this unexpected mode of usage in a vehicle such as that, surely. Or maybe not. <laughs> have they not paved the road to Australia's Mecca? Dingo Piss Creek. And let me know in the comments, would paving the road to the creek make Australia less shit or more shit? I can't decide. Like, I can see this thorny issue both ways. Help me out by letting me know in the comments. Anyway, Chill Bee's mob says the cracking issue might be recurring after the crack has been fixed once. Cracks may show up within an engine bay on the inner guard, such as near the VIN plate or suspension towers. To which I would respectfully retort, FFS, how hard is this? Welding up a crack in a bit of steel is actually not that hard. You just drill it out at the ends, give it a bit of a bevel, a bit of a clean up, cheeky little preheat, spray it with perhaps a bit of ER70S6 or something. Whatever you've got in Yo Mig would probably be good enough. Perhaps a little gusset there from Victoria's Secret. That never hurts. Crack repair is not exactly a new process, is what I'm saying. And then there's these allegedly problematic DPFs. According to Chill B's backing vocalists on this issue, we have also received reports that the DPF in certain Isuzu D-MAX vehicles were not working properly and the DPF needed to be replaced and that the replacement of the DPF cost 8,770 smackers. Well, golly gee, Jim Bob, let me just reach down and pick my jaw up off the friggin' floor. A DPF is nothing more than a small stainless steel box with some fireproof filter material inside it. It's got holes for two sort of pedostatic pressure probes at each end. It's not exactly high tech. I've only got two words for that alleged replacement cost. Daylight fucking robbery. Two words. You could make a DPF in China. You could ship it here and sell it for a profit for 250 bucks. Like, there's the size of the gouge 
and the rough end of the pineapple on top, if Chilby's claims are true, is that they're gouging this price out of owners for a design deficiency which they committed. That seems unfair. Looking at this like an engineer, DPFs tell me a lot about the calibre of R&D at play inside various car companies. There has to be a reason why DPF failures in Toyotas and Isuzus and Land Rovers seem to be endemic, whereas they're not with other car makers, especially as all DPFs and installations slash integrations are designed to meet exactly the same exhaust emission standards. This kind of observation is a window that bypasses the bullshit on various car maker websites and the brand affinities of various tribal individuals, and it gives you an unfiltered look inside at who has their R&D shit together and who doesn't. The big question for me is how many of these design deficiencies or this philosophical lack of commitment to getting the details right, both in terms of structural design and powertrain engineering, how many of those carry over to the current model? And how long would it be until evidence of this, if there is any, surfaces and we get to go through the whole uplifting discovery process again? Like, dude, as a risk management exercise, which you should run every time you buy an expensive widget, such as a car, this class action investigation would raise serious concerns about Isuzu for me. And they're just allegations at this point, obviously, which are ultimately for a court to determine if it gets that far. But if I were in the market for a vehicle right now, I would be seriously concerned about Isuzu getting the hair and makeup right. Partly this would be because class actions usually do not have legs if car makers bend over backwards to support owners who experience legitimate serious problems and they do whatever they can to fix things. But from what I've seen of Isuzu Ute, that is not my impression of how they roll. I also wanted to let you know about the class action investigation so you could register if you own a D-Max or an MUX that has made one or both of these malodorous messes in its trousers. Perhaps you would like to make yourself a pain in Isuzu's RS as a gesture of reciprocity. What goes around comes around, dude. BannisterLaw.com.au slash Isuzu to register, or in the immortal words of Adam Bant, just Google it, mate.